If you have not had the pleasure of watching someone with ADHD write a TED Talk, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's like watching a cat with the zoomies having a quarter-life crisis about recycling. <laughs> now, I'm, uh, how many of you, just by show of hands quickly, are um, pyromaniacs? <laughs> okay, great, so this is gonna be new for most of you. I'm a painter, not a pyro, but I did grow up in a fire department family. In fact, when my parents were expecting me, they started a fire investigation company. So my upbringing was a garage full of burnt washing machines and hardcore fire safety. That's when I learned that this talk was about the creative spark. Well, it got me thinking about real sparks, the kind that create real fires, because the wording is always the creative spark, right? It's never the creative jolt or the creative awakening. Why is that? Well, what I concluded was that a spark, it signifies blatant potential. So if our spark is our origin source for something larger, what takes it from that spark to that fire? Thanks to my upbringing, I actually know the answer to this question. In order to create fires, both literally and as it turns out, figuratively, there are three elements needed. Heat, fuel, and oxygen. So if our creative spark is our little particle of heat ready to ignite, what's our fuel and our oxygen? Okay, fuel, that's the substance which is, well, flammable. So like a uh, ember catches a dry piece of wood, turning it to ash, creative sparks consume problems. Now, the creative sparks, for me, uh, tackle a very specific problem, which is in the world of entertainment. Uh, I'm going to come back to that third piece right there, oxygen, because it's important, but Actually, after hearing all the talks today, you may have guessed what it is, but we're gonna come back to oxygen in a bit. First, I wanna tell you about my spark and the problem that fuels it. So currently, I, uh, sorry, I, I am living in New York City, and my job is that of a scenic artist. But when I was younger, I was misdiagnosed as an overachiever. In reality, it turns out I just have ADHD and I've been channeling it for good. Knowing this helped me a lot in understanding myself my strengths and my weaknesses. I also have a resume out of a Mad Libs book. From scenic and costume designing, to serving and bartending, to holding my tattoo and real estate licenses at the same time, mm -hmm, to shooting competitive archery, and creating realistic severed heads. Mm -hmm, this is Jeff. Before I came to URI, I was actually at Providence College, bio pre-med. My understanding of anatomy has come in very useful over the years, just not in any of the ways I was expecting it to. <laughs> so, unsurprisingly, about a year and a half into my pre-med undergrad, let's just say my creative sparks were flying a bit outside the confines of private Catholic college. So, I decided to transfer here to URI, and I followed my next passion, which was theater. And with my BFA, I was able to pursue scenic designing. I started working in film, and eventually, became a painter for Saturday Night Live. I might not be a doctor, but my mother is still proud of me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, with my degree in theater, I pursuing and ending up in television, I, I uh, was able to use some of my creative skills for things I wasn't expecting, like this. But after school, uh, once I graduated, and I was working in film, I found there were some problems that were really hard to miss. So every day, I see these usable materials that are being discarded, because in that setting, they've served their purpose. Their story has been told. And to summarize what I do, just to be clear, I'm a, a scenic artist, so our job is to paint, texture, and faux finish for movies, television, and live performances. It sounds much more glamorous than it is. Most of the time, I'm making wood look like other wood. Most of my job. <laughs> now, I have an incredible amount of gratitude for my job, because I'm so privileged to work with not only amazing people, but also astoundingly abundant materials as well. Things like sheet and stick lumber, foam core, marble slabs, threaded rods, wallpaper, vinyl, plaster, glitter, and everything in between. We use these materials to recreate a visage of the world, tiny slivers at a time. The results of which are the stories that bring us joy, art, empathy, and connect every single human being. 
But what happens when it's over? When the trucks load up and the crew wraps out, what happens to Carrie Bradshaw's apartment or the shoe store? Most of it gets thrown away. Right now, it is easier and cheaper for production companies to fill a dumpster than to utilize what small amount of infrastructure exists. And this fuel, this problem, it's hard to miss. According to a study done by the mayor's office for film and television, in 2019, New York City had its biggest year of production ever, with over 80 episodic television series and 300 feature films. Take a minute to imagine how many dumpsters that filled. Now, according to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, construction material accounts for roughly 40% of our national waste stream. And from the other side of things, when ordering material for work like mine, we're always told to order about 20% extra just to be safe. It's a smart move, but it's estimated that roughly 30% of the material delivered to a construction site is never touched. Personally, when I see offcuts of map board, I don't see clutter or trash. I see a Dungeons and Dragons battle map just waiting to be built. Every day, I'm seeing these usable materials being discarded because in that setting, they have fulfilled their purpose. Their story has been told. But the piles of spark, the scraps that I saw were more than that. They were piles of ideas, piles of potential, piles of sparks, giving us a solution to a planet-sized problem. On one side, I saw dumpsters full to the brim with usable materials, and on the other, I saw the endless potential for art, as well as neighbors and friends in the community struggling with the cost and availability of these same raw materials. Problem, solution, fuel, spark. It seemed so clear to me. And that idea, that fuel and that spark, it returned again and again and again with each new production. But what about that last piece of the triangle, oxygen? Because I'll tell you, 99% of the time, my sparks fizzle. Doesn't matter if you're a pyromaniac in a haystack, you will never start a fire in a vacuum. So what allows some ideas to, thr to thrive and spread where others die out? It's action. Action is the oxygen in the formula. And it's the only one of those three elements that's genuinely hard. It takes work and integrity and a willingness to accept change where things are broken and to create change where others hesitate. The moment the creative spark took life wasn't creative at all. It was a moment of integrity that allowed me to say, there's a better way that this can be done, and I know I can be the one to bear the torch. For me, the journey to action was understanding myself, knowing that my goals are to lead with love and to tell good stories, that's it. And the zigzag direction of my life and my strange array of talents, they're all assets, putting me exactly where I'm meant to be. Oh, also, I realized that I am the offspring of Mother Goose and an evil genius. Once I put that together, everything about me made so much more sense. <laughs> so what happens when you mix heat, fuel, and oxygen? Or creativity, problems, and action? Fire. My ideas about creative reuse for the problem of entertainment industry construction waste mixed with an infusion of integrity, started a business now known as The Scrap Pile. Our mission is to redirect material waste to local artists and community building needs, bringing these unwanted scraps to the people who can use them and giving them space to create something new rather than adding to landfills. The entertainment industry is booming. We're not gonna stop making film anytime soon. So, we have an opportunity right now to close the loop, to redirect all of this excess to those who lack the access. And we're at the beginning of a new chapter right now. The scrap pile had its first meeting in December of 2022. And I think maybe it's time we reapproach our art. What if instead of ideas that require materials, we focus on the materials that desperately need our ideas? Now, I do still work for SNL. Yes, I should be there now. Uh, but, but, and when asked, but uh, I should mention, by the way, of all the productions I've worked on, shout out to Lauren Michaels, because this is true reuse right here. This is the back of a wall flat from SNL. Each one of those labels represents a sketch that this wall has been in. You guys remember more cowbell? We just pulled that out this season to work with Michael B. Jordan. 
I love my job. <laughs> but with limited storage space in the city, not everyone is able to be as sustainable as SNL. So Monday through Thursday, I talk to people. I turn my ideas into actions. Artists and accountants, social workers and nurses, company founders and theater directors. And I ask their opinions, and I listen. And they talk about what they have in their own scrap piles. And the fire continues to spread. To go to a movie or to watch a play invokes so much opportunity for compassion and change. But the creative spark in me wonders what new opportunities might arise after the curtain falls. Thank you.